God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Reports and correspondence. Anybody got anything? They... Yes, Council McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Appointments Committee is currently accepting applications for a number of positions on town board and commissions. These include the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Library Trustees, the Arts Commission, the Cable Television Advisory Commission, and the newly formed Pedals and Pedestrians Plan Steering Committee. Applications are available at Town Hall from Barbara Ray in the manager's office, and we would like to get them back by the end of this week if possible. So if, you're, if anybody is at all interested in serving one of those positions, please get in touch with Barbara Ray and obtain an application form. If you have questions, she can direct you to the staff person who can best answer your questions about the particular committee. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have one thing I'd like to report, that uh, Judy Dolly is the official representative from the Zoning Board to the Zoning Ordinance and Rewrite Committee replacing Bob Perm. Perm? Perm. I didn't write Never. that one down. Okay, we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting. 12, 94, 95, and 13, 94, 95, held March 15th and 27th. Anybody got any comments or corrections? Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Comment, all in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote seven to nothing. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Anybody out there got something they'd like to say that isn't on the agenda? Yes, Mr. Roberts. State your name and address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jack Roberts. I live at 185 Fowler Road. And I'm here as the uh, chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission. And I would like to invite the council, as well as members of the planning board, uh, land trust and conservation commission, and the members of the new, newly formed P2 committee, to a, uh, a site walk, if you will, on May 13 and May 20. We will be uh, acquiring a bus to take us around to visit the uh, major parcels that the town holds for the uh, future town green belt, if you will. And I did not get a written notice to you earlier, so I'm taking this opportunity to let you know now so you can mark your calendars and have no excuses. So we want to see as many there as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. The gentleman in the back. Uh, good evening, John Ridge, Pleasant Valley Avenue. Uh, could I possibly have an update as to the status of the quiet land next door, the uh, service station, which was the Shell station? Somebody know what's happening in reference to the lease? You ready? Yes. I'll yeah. turn over to the manager. Yes, uh, about a year ago, the town offered a, a lease to the uh, person who had rented it from some time from the previous property owner. Uh, it was formerly owned by Pond Cove Associates. Uh, when we took over the property, we continued a lease with Shirley Kelton uh, at an amount agreed upon at that time. Uh, subsequent, I think it was to that, I think it was last December, uh, she sent me a notice indicating that she wished to exercise her option to terminate the lease and gave the, the notice that were, was required in the lease, which I think was 90 days. Uh, so that made it effective March 30th that she left the premises. Uh, subsequent to her sending that notice, a number of people indicated interest in the property. Uh, the town council authorized me to accept offers, and the town council accepted the offer from the person who offered the highest amount of rent to continue uh, the, the remainder of her lease. Uh, for it's about for another year. Aside from that, the uh, town continues to look at that property, other properties, uh, looking at uh, long-range public safety needs, but no decision has been made. So this party extended the lease for the duration of the period of the original That's correct. lease off? 
Okay, so we're, we're, we're bringing in income on a regular basis, right? We're not losing any income we, due we to any uh, yeah. lack of tenants? Yes, we're losing income during the month of April. Uh, her lease terminated on March uh, 30th, 31st, and the new uh, lease does not begin until May 1. We wanted to assess the building, have a chance to do that, as well as to get it cleaned up a little bit. Okay, good, thank you. Anybody else? If not, we'll move on to item 122, <coughs> to consider a request from the Muscular Dystrophy Association to utilize Fort Williams Park for a ride to the light motorcycles event on May 22nd, 1995, and take any necessary action. Michael, you have a comment or two? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this event uh, first came before the Fort Williams Advisory Commission earlier this year. They gave their unanimous approval. Uh, as a result of an oversight, uh, it did not come to the Council sooner. Uh, recently, the Town Council had a number of questions regarding the event, and I invited uh, representatives of the Muscular Dystrophy Association uh, to be here this evening who are here to answer any questions you may have, as well as to give an overview of the planned activity. And uh, Bill Galvin, of, I believe, of the Muscular Dystrophy Association will make a short presentation. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, would like you. Uh, Give us your name, please. I'm um, Bill Galvin from the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Thank you. Um, our other representative here is Kevin Moran. He's our regional director with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Uh, we also have Tiffany Jones Olson, who is the local district director out of Portland, and also Christopher Bennett, who is our program coordinator for the local area. Okay. Um, the, the event that we are planning is called the Ride to the Light. Uh, it's an event that we proposed to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, excuse me, the Cape Town of Cape Elizabeth Advisory Committee in January. Um, and as, as far as we know, that they had given us approval to go ahead. Um, the questions that I know that, that I've been told of that were coming up of concern were, um, it, is a, it is a motorcycle event, so we will have traffic coming through the area in the town on the morning of, it won't be the morning, on uh, Sunday, May 21st. And uh, we don't anticipate arrival until after 1 o'clock, um, probably arriving in, at the Fort Williams, Cape, uh, Fort Williams Park at around 1.30 <clears throat> and using that site for our, our final destination of the ride. Anybody got a comment one way or the other? Yes, Councilor Dalbert. No, I, I just want to say as a person who uh, raised some questions about uh, this event, the fact that they will not be arriving in the morning when uh, various churches in the area are having services uh, relieves my primary concern. Uh, Anybody? Mr. Excuse Excuse me. Me. Go ahead. To, just to address that uh, question, we did a little bit of uh, research in prior to organizing the event um, to scout out the area, and we did contact the Cape Elizabeth Church of the Nazarene. Uh, they had said their church services are done by noon. Um, St. Bartholomew's has done uh, their services at 11. So they, uh, we anticipate them to be done at noon as well. Um, the Spurwick Church was not active. Um, and on Route 207 down in Scarborough, we had checked out a, a few of the uh, churches in that area as well. So we, we had planned to ride accordingly to uh, come in probably sometime after 1 o'clock. Thank you. Yes, go I'm ahead. just curious, do you have a regular route that you're going to follow? Yes, we do. A matter of fact, we've met with the state police. It's going to be controlled. They're going to have an escort for us. Well, they'll have a state police officer in the front of the ride and in the rear of the ride so that we can maintain an even flow and it helps with the safety of the ride as well um, to bring all the riders in, in one even flow so it's a quick shot. They come in, they'll be at the park and then um, there'll be our activities there at the park and awards ceremony. Anybody else? Councilor Coach. Um, and the material that was presented to us from um, forwarded from the Fort Williams Committee there is a description where you would be having needing space for various food, beverage, and product vendors. Uh, we Is that were correct. Yes, we were looking to have food, food and drink there for the for the riders. Um, MDA will be having a couple tables set up where um, people can that that are in the event participants can buy T-shirts, ride pins, things of that nature. Um, and possibly a couple of uh, arts and crafts. Right, and it says various games and fun activities for riders and their families. Right. Um, you estimated between 200 and 400 riders? Correct. Is that correct? 
In, in your discussion with the Fort Williams Committee, did they emphasize that we have a trash carryout policy? Yes. As a matter of fact, we've confirmed, um, Tiffany, you might be able to help me out on this, a company that will uh, have a garbage um, dumpster there and will provide receptacles as well so that we can bring that in and, and out on the same day. When we've had other large groups using the fort, we've also charged a parking fee. Yes. Was that discussed at all? Yes, it was. And they decided to waive the fee because it is a fundraising event for the organization. Okay, thank you. Councilman McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions. Um, I've heard the number of riders. How many bikes do you expect? Uh, this is the sixth year, I believe, that we've held the ride. Um, our average turnout of riders has been about 250 that have raised funds for MDA. Uh, we're fundraising nature and this hopes to have a few more. And of course, we're hoping for sunny weather. Um, it is a rain or shine event, so that will be contingent upon how many riders show as well. Okay, so that's 250 bikes. Yes. What you're saying. Help me understand what goes on when the group gets to its final destination. Is it open to the public? Like if I stroll in, do I get to <clears throat> play games? We, we want to keep it open to where the general public can come in uh, into our area that they've let us use at the park. Basically, we need to use the park as a parking lot for the motorcycles um, down below. We, we have a per permit through um, Bob Malley that we've arranged to use the top part where the pavilion is so that we can contain most of our activity up there. Most of the activity it includes award ceremony for recognition of fundraisers that have helped us out, um, food vendors up there where they can enjoy a meal. Most of them are going to be riding several hours. Um, so they'll, they'll be doing that. We'll, they'll have the award ceremony and then we'll depart at their leisure. We anticipate uh, pretty much everything to be over but with around 4.30. <clears throat> so the areas of the fort being used by the group would be the upper pavilion area? Correct. Tell me and then down, as you come in um, <coughs> through the park, the, as you come in the driveway, mm -hmm. the headlight is down to the left, and uh, there's kind of a, a, a shell there. Right. To the right of that, there's a parking lot there. That's where we anticipate to park most of the bikes. Mm -hmm. um, we do have permission to use the back part behind the barn, too, uh, to park bikes if we needed to, but I don't know if we would need to do that. And then uh, people would be picnicking or whatever, uh, if you will, up top by the pavilion. Okay, so other areas of the park, this isn't a question to you, I'll get a nod from Bob Nally probably. So other areas of the park are available to the public with no problem as far as working. That was one of my concerns, the kind of precedent this sets. And I, part of my concern came from some of your promotional materials, basically promoting Fort Williams as a wonderful place to have an event like this. And I'm not sure that that's what Fort Williams is all about sometimes. And I've had been torn during the day trying to decide how I wanted to approach this situation. I'll, I'll keep thinking, but thank you for okay. the answers. You're welcome. Next, Council and Nell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With this, uh, it seems to me that the idea of this, uh, what you're proposing, in addition to raising money, is it to raise awareness about muscular dystrophy? Yeah, definitely. It's in, and that's inherent in all the programs that we do. Um, I noticed you guys are doing a little bit of renovation here for accessibility and um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association along with trying to raise money, constantly trying to raise awareness for disability issues and how those that are affected with muscular dystrophy uh, can be very um, beneficial to, to our communities as well. Just real briefly, could you just give us a quick definition or explanation of what muscular dystrophy is? Um, quick, okay. Uh, the Muscular Dystrophy is a not-for-profit national health charity uh, organization that was founded in the 50s uh, by group families uh, to raise funds to find the causes and the cures for 40 different neuromuscular diseases. Um, we also help provide clinics. We have uh, two, excuse me, three clinics in Maine, two, two clinics in Maine. Uh, we have a summer camp program in Maine. Uh, also, money goes towards research um, and research grants and helping to to find the causes and, and hopefully the cures for, for these diseases. I'm just real curious myself, is it something that affects all ages or is it? Yes, it does. It you know, it's a kind of a misnomer. You, everybody hears the term Jerry's kids. And uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Association certainly does um, assist many children. But uh, it's like I said, there's 40 different diseases that we cover. Give you an idea, ALS is one of the diseases, Lou Gehrig's disease, which, you know, as you know, can strike people down in the prime of their life at 30, 40 years old, 50 years old. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? 
Yes, Council McLaughlin. Thank you. I have a question to the manager. Would there be any increased town staff required that day to deal with this event? No, we'll, we'll have our usual park rangers on duty. <clears throat> okay. And am I correct in thinking that this is not an untypical sized group to be using that area of the park? It's, it's not at all unusual for us, particularly weekends, to get large groups of this size. I think what's, what's different here is, is the fact that obviously they're all coming in uh, on motorcycles, which uh, garners some attention, uh, plus there is a fundraising component to it as well. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. just one item that uh, in the future, if we could, on all of these things that are going to happen, even though I'm for them and think they're for a very worthy cause, I think this meeting should have been held two months ago and that I had a chance to vote before the brochure is out telling them where it's going to be and what the admission is going to be and what they're going to have for prizes and who's going to sponsor it. The whole darn thing is all done before it gets to the council. I'm very, I don't like that. I hope we can change it again next year. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? I just, I just want to say, and that's one thought I had in my mind, is the same as Councillor Chapels as far as, and I don't know whether the mistake was made here or somewhere else, but it's something that should have been uh, publicized a little bit more before it come before the council, in my opinion. I support it, and I think you've done a good job as far as not coming through the most residential areas around, like coming through South Poland and into the fort, is coming around Scarborough. It's, it's a little more <coughs> open and what have you, and I think it will be, and I hope you have a real successful day at it. Mr. Yes, sir, Council Dalbach. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I just on that uh, want to uh, make sure this, that issue is not directed at these people. That issue belongs with uh, the town uh, and potentially the Fort Williams Committee. I don't know where it all rests, but it certainly does not uh, belong with these people. Uh, they're between a rock and a hard place. We're between a rock and a hard place, and uh, I certainly will be in favor of a motion to move ahead. Thank you, and I, I agree with that also. Thank you. I don't know just where the, the uh, time lapse come in, but that's okay. Yeah, well, we, we had presented in mid-January to the uh, Advisory Council, right. so just to clarify. Council McLaughlin. I'd like to move that we approve the request from the Muscular Dystrophy Association to util utilize Fort Williams as proposed on May 21st, 1995. Second. Moved and second. Did you have some? No. Okay. I thought you had your hand up. I did. You did. It just passed by at this point. Oh. We allow any speeches. Go ahead. Everyone understand the motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote. Seven to nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. We look forward to having a great event, and hopefully we can keep everybody happy and look forward to coming back next year, hopefully, as well. I think it's a Thank real you. good card. It's hard to keep us all happy. <laughs> Item 123, to consider a recommendation for the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding sanitary facilities at Fort Williams Park and taking the necessary action. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Who's going? Yes, this is a report coming to you dated March 23rd, 1995, uh, just recently voted on by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. It's something that uh, they did do at the request of the town council. Uh, this was not an idea that the committee came up with in its own to do a study. And Jeff Van Fleet and other members of the commissioner here uh, to present the report along with the consultant who worked on it. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Mike indicated, uh, we have uh, spent considerable time, not only in recent months, but in recent years, uh, wrestling with the uh, notion of installing rest facilities at Fort Williams Park. Uh, that uh, effort, I guess, has culminated uh, here this evening. And uh, my role as chairman of the advisory commission tonight, I think I have some fellow commission members, I see I do in the, in the back but uh, in the forefront uh, of the issue uh, is to really answer your questions from a policy standpoint and address any of the issues that are reflected in the memo of March 16th uh, to the council 
Uh, with me here to address your technical questions uh, is Tom Emery, uh, the architect uh, uh, retained by the town to uh, assist us in this project. Anybody got a question for Jeff? They got their own. Okay. Does Tom have a few words he'd like to say? <coughs> or do you want to wait for a question? I would leave that to the council's discretion. I'm ready to make a quick presentation. If there are no questions I need for a presentation, I'll wait until there are questions. Why don't you make a, your presentation, OK? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jeff and the rest of the committee members and uh, do somewhat to our schedule. I also thank Paul Laughlin, uh, Paul, Laughlin, Paul Thielen, uh, past uh, chairman of the Fort Williams Commission. Uh, I guess anyone who's uh, studied any subject that does not define science realizes that it takes twice as much effort to define a subject matter than if one knows exactly what the, the problem is and, and what the single solution is. Uh, what Tarian Architects has attempted to do in this matter is to explore both feasible alternatives regarding rest facilities and also address uh, the issue that came later on during the study was the issue of, of a concession stand. And as outlined in the report, we looked at uh, six or seven uh, issues. First of all, the primary purpose of the study was not to uh, comment, on, comment on whether the rest facility uh, is appropriate to the park, but rather uh, leave that to a policy decision for the Commission and the Council to wrestle with. But to determine, uh, to help in determining that decision as to what uh, a range of probable construction costs might be. And also as a second part of the study was to look at the, the possible costs or feasibility of a, of a concession stand. Uh, for the public's information, the scope of the study compared costs uh, for s several alternatives. Initially, we looked at the possibility of reusing two existing buildings within the fort, one of which is the militia storage building over by the public works uh, maintenance area, and the second was the block storage building, which we refer to as building site one, which is the block storage building which is located in the gravel parking lot uh, used for the picnic shelter area. We also looked at several scenarios dealing simply with the feasibility of a rest facility. We looked at the possibility, uh, thirdly, of a rest facility with a concession stand, all housed within one structure. We looked at the cost and feasibility of a rest facility <coughs> and a concession stand in separate but adjacent structures. And then we looked at several uh, building site options. We looked at, uh, Besides looking at existing buildings, we looked at locating a new building at building site one, which was a gravel parking lot below the picnic shelter. This was the site generally preferred by the Fort Williams Commission in our initial review. And we also looked at a site which we refer to uh, as a grassy knoll site, uh, which is just to the west of Humphreys Road and below the picnic shelter, within a reasonable walking distance to uh, Portland headlight and the new central parking lot. Uh, as I hope everyone understands, although the fort was served by uh, a common sewer system when the fort was active, all of that central sewer has been abandoned because it was an over overboard discharge system. Uh, we looked initially at the feasibility of extending a new public sewer into the park. Uh, this is not the first time this question has been raised. Uh, and that was discounted immediately because the cost was greater than $100,000. Uh, we then, uh, with the help of Albert Frick, a soil scientist who's done a lot of work in this community, uh, walked the site with Bob Malley and identified uh, some preliminary septic site areas. It should be noted that we discounted any area on the ocean side of the main access road, both because of the steep topography, but mostly because of the difficult soil conditions all of that area is rubble fill uh, and is unsuitable for septic. We then focused on uh, three sites that we refer to as site A, B, and C. Again, site A is the gravel parking lot located at the base of the picnic shelter. That site was selected because it was adjacent to the block building site and uh, we wanted to see what the subsoil conditions were at that location to see if there was any feasibility at all to using that site. Septic site B is an area, again, west of uh, Humphreys Road, uh, located 
below the picnic shelter and just down slope from the building site in that area and was a site of, of some promise but had some limitations to the maximum size of the shelter. And last we looked at septic site C which is at the eastern end of the parade ground uh, and as it turns out is one of the few sites of native soils left in Fort Williams Park. We also uh, within the last month for purposes of answering the question looked at what would happen with providing a facility that would serve the entire population of Fort Williams Park. We had discounted that as a alternative in the initial study uh, having a basic sense that it would be far too expensive uh, for uh, uh, any reasonable budget, well in excess of $150,000 or $200,000. Um, we then began to discuss the issue of the building program. Who is it for? Uh, how large does it have to be? Uh, and came to one conclusion, and that would be that it would only be a seasonal facility. It would have running water, would have uh, flush toilets. It would not be a privy type facility that the state parks um, often use. And for our initial uh, investigations, we assumed that it would serve a sector of the park only. Um, with some desire, we believe that it would be accessible to the users of the museum and gift shop area, and to some extent, bus traffic. As we note in the report, we are concerned that it, it doesn't become a, a sole use uh, for those uh, particular users. Uh, we then looked at several ways of trying to calculate how large uh, this facility would be and how large the septic system needed to be and came to an initial conclusion that perhaps we would look at the, the construction costs and then determine what size of facility could reasonably uh, be afforded. And based on that, the report recommends a uh, building site too, which is a grassy knoll site utilizing uh, the adjacent uh, septic field which would have a limitation of 1,500 gallons per day in terms of uh, sewage flows, uh, which would be enough for eight fixtures, uh, three toilets in the women's side, two toilets in the urinal, and a couple of lavatories. Uh, the report assumes that the building is somewhat uh, bulletproof, that it's made out of uh, masonry construction, which is reflected in the higher construction costs. The, again, for the public, the rest facility that we identified as the preferred alternative uh, at septic site B and building site 2, uh, we estimated a cost for the building site and septic system, uh, not including engineering, but including a 10% contingency to be in the neighborhood of $74,000. Uh, the same facility utilizing septic site C would cost almost an additional $20,000 because of some additional costs of uh, earthwork to do the, f the septic field, but primarily because of the requirement for pumping and the removal of ledge, both at the building site and also in extending the sewer to that site. Lastly, with a, with a concern regarding how many people could utilize this facility, we took a PAC study that was done in June of 92 and selected a Sunday and during the hours of eight in the morning, 10 in the morning until 8 in the evening came up with a total visitors uh, count for the park. Based on that uh, and as a report noted uh, we excluded people who simply came into the park and looked at the Portland headlight and then drove out. We were looking for the longer term uh, stays and based on those longer term visits we estimated using the revised state plumbing codes, which are a little more lax than the current one, uh, hopefully to be adopted in May, however, that we would be required to have a leach system in the neighborhood of more than fourfold that which is being uh, proposed under the recommended uh, uh, proposal. And the cost, therefore, would be in the neighborhood of three to fourfold of $74,000. The other concern that we had, uh, regardless of the increased cost to serve all visitors to the park, was the feasibility of meeting all needs in one location within the park. And that was a matter of some discussion and debate uh, with the commission. And it was felt that although the location is within a, a two and a half 
minute to five minute walk uh, to the Portland headlight, about 650 feet uh, as the crow flies, uh, that it still would not be convenient enough for people, particularly who are using the beach, which is a, a considerable segment of the population uh, going to the park, and that if the issue of handicapped uh, portables or toilets became an issue in that area, that there is, uh, the state has designed a privy system uh, which uses two holding tanks, uh, which is, enables, rather than doing two privies in one holding tank, you do one and it's handicapped accessible. That was discussed with the public works director and was not looked upon particularly favorably because of the odor problem and, and maintenance issues related to that. Um, but that, in a nutshell, summarizes all of the issues that we investigated. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anybody had a comment? Question? Tom? <coughs> Other committee? Yes, Council Delva. Yeah, let me ask one question based on your experience, Tom, and the, and the design is, is uh, fine. I, I, I think you've done a great job there. But if, if we were to say, uh, yes, go ahead uh, today, for example, when this would not be available this summer? No, it wouldn't. It would, may be available by, by late summer at the earliest, given the fact that it would have to be competitively bid. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else? This isn't a question for, for Tom, but it addresses a little bit more of Councillor Dalbeck's uh, point. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin called me earlier today and inquired as to whether or not this was a new use and, and as such would need to be referred to the Planning Board as well as having been reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. In the discussion with her, I indicated that I didn't feel as though the restrooms were a new use because there had been uh, uh, new uses. Uh, there had been use of portable toilets there for years and years, and I, I figured the use was continuing. Uh, however, uh, it, it caused me to relook at the ordinance. <laughs> we had a wonderful discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, keep going, Mike. It caused me to relook at the ordinance, and what the ordinance reads is the town council shall first submit any proposal for new buildings or uses. And this, this is, in fact, a new building. So the, the point that we're at is that the council has a number of options before it. One is to send it to the planning board uh, to review the use, or two, to, to kill the proposal right here uh, and not refer it, and uh, that would, uh, as I said, kill it right here. Thank you. Anybody else? The excuse me, review the building, not the use. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. For the public record, I assume that some of the people watching TV and perhaps some of the people in the audience recognize that I'm chairman of the planning board. Uh, my involvement in this project uh, rose out of Carrying Architects having prepared the master plan before I was uh, a board member and certainly before I was a chairman of the planning board. And it was my understanding that uh, these issues are reviewed by the town council and were not referred to the planning board. Obviously, uh, that's not the case this evening. If this were to come before the planning board, I certainly would be stepping aside and not uh, uh, being involved in any discussion on this matter. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> yes, Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you. I'm sorry. Do we have estimated annual costs on maintenance of this structure? Not at this point that I know of. When, any idea when we'd be privy to that information? <laughs> ah, slow. You have to leave now. <laughs> Too much TV time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I have you got further comment? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll wait. I, I do, but uh, I think we'll wait till we have a motion, perhaps, or. Should we, should we, can we keep discussing it or should we have a motion first? Nobody has anything to say, so I guess you're making a motion. Why don't you Anybody wait? out there has anything they'd like to add to this one way or the other? Or against or in? Hey, you got it? Yes. Gentlemen, right down here to the mic and state your name and address, please. Well, that's the problem. I don't live with people listening. Oh. Well, we'll let you speak since you're up. We're a friendly group. Oh. Frank oh. Nappy, 43 Oriel Street, Westbrook. This, this toilet facility down at the, the park, take 4th of July. Now, there must be 
tons of people down there for the fireworks. What are they doing as of right now? Where's all this sewage going? Currently, uh, we use portable toilets, and it's uh, they're furnished by Blow Brothers, and they pump them out and dispose of them, dispose of the material. I would assume they have an arrangement with uh, uh, a sewer treatment plant or a similar facility. Okay. Basically, I guess that's all I have. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? Yes, Tom. Mr. Chairman and Council, just to follow up on that issue, uh, I should have stated that uh, the design of this facility recognizes the need to continue to use uh, those types of uh, portable toilets for special events, whether it's a symphony or something like the fundraiser that was discussed today. It would be a tremendous burden on the septic system to have 400 users suddenly packed in and, and waiting to use a facility of this nature. Thank you. Anybody else? Somebody care to make a motion? No, it's a little too late. We're back here to the council and ready to move on the question. I'm sorry. Nobody cares to make a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. You don't have you to go higher. Than. Okay. <coughs> council of Chicago Shaw. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we. Um, accept the recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and refer to the Planning Board a review of the new building proposed. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Council McGough. Council Cogswell, I'm looking at the memorandum we have from the town planner relative to an upcoming item on the agenda asking that not the upcoming item which would be a similar situation um, to be referred to the planning board. They're at, she's recommending that we give quite explicit direction, and I would ask if you would consider an amendment to your motion that the planning board provide informal comments rather than a full site plan review. I don't see this as a full site plan review, so I will amend it to have formal comments from the planning board. Is that what you want? Informal comments? Informal comments. Which was signed to make them formal. All right. <laughs> I don't think that I don't they need to go through a site plan no, I don't and a public hearing at the planning board level to do this. I think it's something that could be done in workshop and then perhaps you know, authorized at a regular meeting if need be if they can't give us workshop comments out of workshop. I think the, the way I've, and I've, you know, when I talked to the manager today, it was because I finally looked at the ordinance about Fort Williams, which I had not reviewed recently. And the way I was interpreting it was that it did not need to go to a public hearing at the planning board level. Something that's referred to the board about for use or building at <laughs> Fort Williams. Thank you. <coughs> Does the second agree with the change in the motion? Do you? That's you. Do we have a second? Yes. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Everybody understand the motion? Could we, could we hear it again? Because I want some discussion. Oh, we're going to have discussion. Council of Dogby. Um, I'm going to vote against this motion. And I just want to explain where I am. Uh, I don't like the idea of creating work for anybody unless there's a good chance of, or at least unless I feel that that work ought to go ahead. At this point in time, uh, with the uh, budget stresses that we're under and a number of projects, I have a difficult time voting to spend uh, taxpayer money uh, to create a um, uh, toilet facility, which um, I think will be uh, primarily utilized by uh, people from um, out of town, at least until such time as somehow or other we get a revenue stream uh, going for the fort, whether that is in admission fees or whether it is uh, a concession stand that works, and I'm not here to debate whether a concession stand might or might not generate any funds, but we have to have those people who are coming from outside and who would be primarily utilizing 
a facility of this nature, providing a revenue stream uh, to support that uh, uh, particular facility before I would want to go ahead and tie up uh, the uh, planning board's time uh, trying to uh, deal with this issue. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Mr. Chapel. I strongly support this uh, restroom facility at Fort Williams for the following reasons. Uh, Few of us were on the original committee at Fort Williams many, many years ago. And at that time, they were going to have high-rise apartment buildings and an IGA store down where the gift shop is and big plans, big things were going to happen. And finally, we got some sense through some of them, and uh, you see what the fort is today. We're very proud of it. We've had some wonderful gifts given to us. You think about them. We purchased the whole darn thing for $200,000. Just think of it today. And then on top of that, we had the lighthouse deeded to the town. They never heard of things like that, and we were one of the first ones to have it happen here. And then we've got a gift shop that's making money every year. I keep hearing this idea about the out-of-town people, and they're the, going to be the ones to use it. That's why I'm building it is so that there will be something there for them so when they go back home we won't get letters back to the town. It was wonderful visiting Cape Elizabeth, but it was certainly uh, wasn't wonderful visiting those uh, areas that uh, you don't want to go into because they're not kept the way they should be. It's impossible with that many people. Now we're going to have problems with a restroom. We've got problems of keeping it clean, keeping it managed, keeping the trash and so forth. We can stand the problems. We've had them before. And I think anything that brings in, they claim a million visitors, I'll settle for 800,000, whatever it is, per year, that we des they deserve something from us. I don't care what you say. As a taxpayer, I think that I would uh, strongly support restrooms. And when this one's complete, I will strongly support number two when we get to it, many probably years down the road. This will not be ready till 1996. I look forward to it, and I hope we get the support of enough for so that we can put it through. We've fooled around with Cape Elizabeth, Fort Williams, too long. We've never done right by it, except our decisions up to date have been right. The fort, it proves it over there when you see it. Look how it's used. Look at the kids. Look at the uh, people on Sunday. Look at the people on Fourth of July. Look at the people for the Portland Symphony. Look at people for Kite Day. My goodness, it's a wonderful place, and I think it deserves a restroom. Thank you. Thank you. Council Liddell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to express basically two points of view. I would agree with uh, Council Chapel that w there's a need there, and I, and I am uh, in favor of having uh, uh, toilet facilities there at the fort. Uh, however, uh, I would like to uh, basically, um, second Councillor Dalbeck's concerns that uh, I don't think we should be going to the to the taxpayers to, to fund this. And I think uh, as soon as we uh, uh, figure out how to uh, produce a revenue stream uh, from the fort, I would be w uh, willing to support the toilet toilet facilities there. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. Next, Council Cogshaw. In my motion, I'm just basically referring this to the Planning Board for their comments. I believe the actual approval of funds to be spent would be a second step before the Council. We're not doing that tonight. It has been a long-standing complaint for a number of years that <clears throat> the portable toilets we had were a public disgrace, very unpleasant. Um, it ultimately became a goal of the council and the council chairman over two years ago. And I think <clears throat> that we should proceed with this, at least in these planning stages. So when, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have the funds available, we can act. And I'm not saying that we even would try to do it this season, just because we would be rushing to bid. And often when you do that, things are far more expensive, be bitter, if we decide to do it, to put it out next fall or next winter for bid. But I think we should <clears throat> keep this moving. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Linnell. I, I think uh, Council Dahlbeck raised, really made a good point that, to, about uh, giving the planning board work to do until we're 
we really have a, a better sense of what we want to do. And so, uh, uh, while I appreciate uh, your, your comments, uh, uh, I think I will tend to uh, not support this motion at this time. Thank you. And yes. Um, I believe that the toilet facilities at Foyans would be something very nice to have. I don't think that there's something that we have to have, though. And at this point, um, my financial philosophy for the town is that we only spend money if we absolutely have to. And I just don't think that that's an absolute necessity at this time. I would like to see that in future plans. And so maybe it wouldn't hurt to go to the planning board to have the plans in place. But I don't see that happening for quite a while. So it would, I, I really would question whether or not <coughs> Um, now is the time to send it to the planning board. Perhaps the future would be better. Thank you. Anybody else? Council and now. Just one more thought. I, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, the folks that uh, worked on the project, and I think they've done a great job and applaud all their efforts. And, and when we get the uh, when we get the funding lined up, I, I think it would be uh, uh, something that would be nice to have and even necessary. But uh, when we can pay for it, I would fully support it. Thank you. Council Cogshaw. I'd just like to ask Mr. McGovern how much it costs us each year to rent the portable toilets and to maintain them I will, as far as pumping. It's, uh, I didn't recall, but the Public Works Director put up five fingers, which I assume <laughs> means $5,000. Didn't we have a budget of almost eight to $10,000 last year for that? seem to me it's closer to $8,000 that we had in the budget. Maybe we didn't spend it. <coughs> <laughs> I don't know. They have, what, $50 per, per unit per week, per month? Fifty. Yeah, that's right. And then we, we also have been paying extra. There's some money in the Portland Headlight account now because we've had to have the ones, some of them clean three times a week because of the complaints on odors. So. The cost has been going up because of frequency of cleaning. Thank you. Anybody else? Everybody understand the motion? Or we vote on it, I'm going to say I'm going to support the motion because I think it should be uh, looked into and be ready to uh, move forward at a later date because I think the planning board does have to take a look at the structure. I think that's part of the Right. What's your motion, Mr. What, what is the motion that's on the table? Uh, you've seconded. I know. I want to make sure. <laughs> I want to make sure. Council Cogshaw, would you please read the motion? What do you I'm want? I'm going to ask the clerk since she took the. Well, uh, she's motion. searching the notes. Right here. To acknowledge receive the Fort Williams Advisory Committee's recommendation to refer the new building proposal to the Planning Board for their informal comments. Okay. Yes? Yeah. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? It's one, two, three, four to three. I think the way I got it. Four to three. Mm -hmm. Four in favor, three opposed. All set? Mm -hmm. Item 124, to consider referring to the planning board and the Fort Williams <laughs> Advisory Commission a proposed proposal to construct a multi-purpose ball field at Fort Williams Park behind the park <coughs> maintenance building near Delno Park and take any necessary action. Mr. Manager, you have a couple of comments? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to indicate that this first uh, came to the Fort Williams Committee uh, sometime last fall. It came to the Town Council on a very preliminary basis. Uh, I believe it was in January. It was very late night at, uh, that you had the bikeway hearing. Uh, this comes about as a result of a group of citizens, uh, primarily led by folks who are affiliated with Little League as well as soccer and other groups, who are very interested in, in improving uh, and enhancing uh, the athletic fields uh, for the youth and others of our community. Uh, they've been working, developing plans, uh, which you have, uh, which you can see up here on the board before you. Uh, I would like to mention that there has been some some talk about who's been involved in the process up to now, 
and essentially this has been a, a private process. Uh, there are a few individuals involved who serve on some of our committees, uh, including the Fort Williams Committee and the, the Planning Board. Uh, if this should be referred to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and to the Planning Board, those individuals have indicated to me that they will be abstaining or recusing themselves from participation in order to avoid uh, any conflict of interest. Uh, Dan Fisher, who is the president of Cape Elizabeth Little League, uh, currently uh, is, is here. Mike Roy, who's the chairman of the committee, and Pat Carroll, who's the, uh, the volunteer consultant working with it, as well as some other individuals. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is just make a few comments, and then Pat it knows most about what the actual site plan has to it. And um, my name is Dan Fisher. I live at 22 Campion Road. Uh, Pat Carroll will do some of the. Um, we'll, we'll talk to you about what what's in this actual site plan. And there are a number of other people that are involved in this process um, and in this program uh, uh, here tonight who we may lean on when you have questions. Um, first of all, I'm not president of Little League. I haven't been since uh, October of last year. And I, I, I think I said in the January meeting, although it was quite late, that, that um, this is not a Little League or a Cape Elizabeth Soccer Association um, committee. This is a group of concerned citizens that know about an extreme need for fields in this town. Um, and I'm going to just briefly go over a few statistics for you to kind of give you an idea of, of why there is an extreme need for fields. Uh, one of the people that I talked to was Jetty Lavasser, who is the district administrator for uh, the 21 Little Leagues in the Portland area, to kind of get an idea of what the number of fields that there are in the Portland area in similar towns like ourselves. And I'm just going to give you uh, what, what goes on in a few of the towns. In Falmouth, there are four Little League fields with 500 participating Little League registr registrations. In Westbrook, there are three Little League fields with 600 registrations. However, they have two additional fields available to them through the Town Park and Rec Department. In South Portland, there are two separate Little Leagues, one South Portland American and one South Portland National. One has, um, they both have three fields. One has 400 kids, the other has 450 kids. And uh, in addition to that, the South Portland uh, Rec Department has a number of fields available to them for overflow. Scarborough is very much in the same situation that we are. They have three ball fields for 700 kids. And they are in the process of building as many fields as they can possibly build um, as fast as they can do it because of an extreme need. And again, they have a number of fields available to them through the Scarborough Park and Rec Department. Our town has three ball fields, Playstead Park, Lions Field, and the stadium field at Fort Williams available for 640 Little Leaguers. In addition, approximately, it takes approximately one field for every 125 to 150 Little League players. And to kind of give you an idea how critical that is and point out just how that works in this town, we have about 85 participating at one field at Playstead Park full-time and another 52 participating at Playstead Park part-time. That'll kind of give you an idea of the number of players that it takes and that you go drive by Playstead Park any night during the week and all day on Saturday until about 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. That ball field's in continuous use. In addition, we've had a problem in this town um, uh, lately be with the Soccer Association. And just to kind of give you an idea, it, last year, uh, last fall, there were about approximately 180 kids participating in Cape Elizabeth Youth Soccer Association. Out of that, there's about 11 teams. Those 11 teams had to, to play, they play approximately a 20-game schedule. In that 20-game schedule, they were only able to have four or five home games because of the lack of field space. Um, in researching this and, and, and to bring to your attention, I spent some time with, uh, or I spent some time on the phone with Sue Weatherby, who's the director of the community services program, who has a lot to do with the fields in town. <coughs> and again, we talked about the extreme need for fields in this town, and it's no longer just a need for some of the athletic associations in town, but also for, uh, the, for the schools. We've already lost uh, an entire field, at least for temporarily, at the middle school. Um, there are more teams being added at all school levels all the time. Um, 
there are there is now beginning to be soccer um, programs available in the springtime. We have a no cut policy in our middle middle school, which means that every kid that comes out for a ball team has to play on on that ball team. That further stresses the field. And the other thing that Sue told me is that none of the fields get rested. And in fact, um, coming this June first, the lower soccer field is going to be seeded by the Soccer Boosters Association. And by doing that, we eliminate another ball field that's available for our eight, nine-year-old girls that, are, that play in the Little League. So they play about a half a season this year, and we're looking for another field for them to play on because there is nowhere for them to play currently. Um, basically, there's a huge stress on the fields, and that was the point that Sue had, had made to me. Um, in addition to that, um, some people say I have a very vested interest in this, and, and I may because I'm heavily involved in it. But by the time these ball fields are, are completed, my kids will be in high school and will never play on a, a sport on any of these fields. I think that it's so important for the youth in this town to have the recreational facilities here that they can utilize to the best of their abilities. And we have some places, not very many, available to us in this town. Um, like I said, I'll be available for questions as soon as um, Pat's going to give you a short talk on the, uh, on the actual site plan. Hi, my name is Pat Carroll. I live at 63 Cottage Farms Road. And uh, I've been involved with Dan and Little League for a number of years here. And uh, I was actually pretty excited when I got a call to see if they could, I could help them on uh, devising a plan for a field or a number of fields in Cape Elizabeth. Um, as Dan said, there's, there's been a really pent up need and um, I guess once, once we decided this year that we were really going to try to move forward and uh, try to build a field or to actually we were really looking to possibly construct two fields this year, um, we really began kind of a site selection process. and. Uh, the first, first thing we really looked at is, you know, where can we build these fields? And uh, in trying to determine a, an acreage or a size for building a field, we took a look at the, the potential or the mandate to really develop a multi-purpose field, that being a, a field that could accommodate baseball and soccer on the same field. Now, in order to do this, the reality of the situation is that we're looking at really something in the neighborhood of three to four acres in size. So it's not, it's not a small little piece of ground that we're looking at. We're looking at a considerable parcel of property that uh, ideally would be relatively flat. Um, it would have proximity to other fields that, uh, that are in town that, where the majority of activity occurs. Now currently, as Dan said, there's an enormous amount of Little League activity that occurs at, at uh, Fort Williams or in the vicinity of Fort Williams. Uh, the other area is, is there's some little league activity that occurs at the sco high school, and uh, Lions Field is the other place where little league activity occurs. Um, we, we began there, and we looked at, uh, we, in addition to that, we looked at um, land that the Land Trust currently owns, and uh, the reality of it is that there really isn't a parcel that the Land Trust owns that, that really fit our needs. Um, we looked at Lions Field, and initially we thought we could probably fit a couple of ball fields up there, but the reality of Lions Field is that there's some fairly severe slopes. Uh, we've got, um, out of the 25 acres, probably about 10 acres of it is in uh, wetland setbacks due to the critical wetland zone, and uh, the soils and, and subsurface conditions, in addition to the slopes, really make Lions Field fairly, um, I guess I wouldn't say infeasible, but costly to develop. So the thought was we could probably squeeze one field at Lions Field. Um, that left us looking for another field. And uh, I guess, you know, when we first started looking at Fort Williams, the reality of it was there was a, there was a master plan in place. Um, and uh, that's where the majority of activity really occurred. And, um, and the inf infrastructure was in place for there. There's, there's existing parking that was created uh, fairly recently. There's uh, utilities, water, and electricity um, in place or very nearby. And so we felt very strongly that, that the precedent was there to, 
to begin to developing Fort Williams. Um, the area we're, we're looking at is, um, if we look on the Fort Williams master plan here, the area we're looking at is directly behind the public works maintenance garage. It's on a it's on a knoll here, which was formerly the uh, National Guard tenting site. Now, this area is relatively flat. It consists of about three and a half to four acres in size, and uh, about half of the site here is open grassland now. That currently is being used by Public Works as their snow dump area. Um, the rest of the site, the remainder of the site here, there's a series of existing concrete tent pads that pretty much cover the site. Um, those tent pads are pretty broken up and uh, decomposed and, and the entire area is kind of grown up and lightly, with lightly wooded sumac and birch and some other uh, vegetation, excuse me, vegetation. Um, the site plan that we've developed really is, uh, we, we took the initial master plan here which indicated a multi-purpose field and we took that as as our first given. And the site plan has really evolved out of looking at some other criteria um, in addition to the master plan and in, in trying to how the, how the multi-purpose field would best fit the uh, topography in the site. Um, initially, and in, in the point, point of view, the best orientation on a baseball field according to the Little League, is uh, in an east-northeasterly direction. That is from home plate to the, the pitcher's mound and second base with a uh, runner in an east-northeast. And um, the master plan pretty much lays out their field in that orientation. When we begin to look at this on the site, uh, we notice a couple things. First of all, that it put home plate the furthest away from any adjacent parking. And we felt like uh, it was, it was pretty clear that we really didn't want to encourage vehicular traffic and, and open up the upper part of the, the uh, site here to, to parking. We also didn't want to have to encourage uh, participants and spectators to walk three or 400 feet or more from a parking lot. Um, so then we began to look at this side of the site. This is the public works garage here. This is the, uh, the Little League storage equipment building. Um, this area right in here is the new parking lot that was constructed, uh, I guess, about two years ago. So we begin to look at this area in here as far as um, a location for the baseball diamond itself. And in, in thinking about the orientation, which really becomes pretty critical when you're playing in the evening hours, um, it was felt very strongly that moving the baseball diamond to this back corner here really gave us the best orientation. Uh, this, this orientation here is very similar to the orientation of the ball field at Playstead Park. So, and we've, we've, people have been playing there for years and years and we really haven't had a problem. We also looked at orienting in this direction here. This orientation here is very similar to the orientation at the uh, parade ground on the ball field there. At the, uh, and that orientation, I don't know if anybody's played there in a late evening, but it's, it's very, very dangerous. I remember umpiring there one night a couple of years ago and uh, I was behind the pitcher and he put up a line drive right in the face and we were totally blinded. Nobody could see the ball coming at all. And so, we, you know, orientation is, is a very critical issue. It, it really relates a lot to safety and liability. So we felt very strongly that, that the ball diamond ought to go here. Now the other advantage to putting the ball diamond here is the fact that it really removes that activity as far as possible from the Delano Park neighborhood. And we felt like that was, that was very important in our mind because um, although there are, there are scattered houses through here, the further that we can pull this away, um, the better off everyone's going to be. The other advantage to locating here is the fact that we're in very close proximity to the parking lot. So a lot of, a lot of things kind of fell together, and we feel very strongly that this is a pretty good plan that really addresses a lot of the, uh, the concerns, it, it addresses the constraints on the site, and it, um, and it really takes advantage of the site to its utmost potential. Now, from a 
detailed technical point of view, what we intend to do here, right now currently the site is, uh, like I said, about half wooded and half open. We intend to clear approximately to approximately about down to here, uh, leaving about a 60 to 100 foot buffer between the lower road of Merriman and, and the upper side of the, the ball field. So there will be a, a very natural, undisturbed buffer area that will currently exist. Um, we intend to cut the upper end of the site down, balancing the cut and fill and pushing out. So at the upper end of the site, up here adjacent to the public sort garage, we will probably have about a three foot cut up there. So as you come in this road, the ball field actually drop down about three feet, about this high. Um, we will push that out and level this area off, and at the lower end down in here, we're looking at probably about four feet of fill above the existing grade that's out there now. Um, but the entire site will be graded out flat. We're looking at a, at a uh, skinned infield area very similar to Lions Field or Playstead Park. And uh, some chain link fencing that wraps around the back, ties into the uh, backstop area, and provides some enclosure areas for the teams. We're not looking at, at this time in, to construct dugouts. Uh, we're not looking at uh, any kind of power requirements for uh, public address system. <coughs> or uh, lights or anything of that sort. Uh, we would like to be able to provide some water out here primarily to keep the field green in the summertime because uh, as you know most of these fields tend to tend to burn up pretty easily. Um, as far as access from this parking lot we intend to construct a uh, stone dust path and we'd, we'd like to work with Bob Malley to, de to designate a couple of handicapped parking spaces here. This handicap or this this stone dust path will be handicap accessible, so we we could get uh, you know, would be in compliance with ADA, and we could get handicap folks up here to either participate in, in the in the games or um, as a spectator. The intent would be that the gate that remains here now would remain. This entire area would be um, vehicular free, and uh, I think you know visitors to the park could have full use of, of the walkways and roadways that exist here while play is going on on the ball field. So that pretty much sums it up. I guess uh, the only other thing I'd like to say is that we, we took a measurement here. The home plate is actually about 460 feet in a straight line from, from home plate to the Delano Park fence <coughs> here. Um, there is, we are proposing to plant some type of a landscape buffer between the roadway and the fencing in order to, in addition to the, to the distance, uh, to help screen and buffer the, uh, the use from the Delano Park people. So we have met with uh, Mr. Boomer from Delano Park. We've uh, presented the plan to him and uh, we're more than willing to work with the Delano Park neighbors and uh, feel very strongly that this is a good plan and it's good for the town and uh, we'd like to have you in Thank you. See anybody else on your committee wants to speak? No? Okay, thank you. just have one more comment and that is I just want to restate what was said in January <laughs> that this will be built with no town funds, that we have a complete fundraising campaign that's supposed to start on May 18th and run uh, through October. While they're up there, we'll entertain some questions, and we'll get to you, okay? Yeah. Mr. Bullman, that all right? Sure. Okay, then. Council Linnell. Yeah, I've just got a question uh, either one of you could answer. Uh, as I understand it, you've already lined up meetings with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and the Planning Board Workshop. Could you tell us when those are? We have uh, a meeting with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission this Thursday. And I believe we're scheduled for a workshop with the planning board on May 2nd. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I got a question for Mr. Carroll. Do you think that 460 feet from home plate to Delano Park is sufficient with some of the heavy hitters we have? Yeah. <laughs> that could be tough, sir. I want to make sure that there will be no uh, home runs landing in their backyard over there before I... We're pretty safe. I think so. Tennis first. Anybody else? 
Council Cogshaw. I just wanted to know the names of the people who were on this field committee. Um, to be honest with you, there's about 80 at about this point. 80, but do you have a nucleus? Um, yeah, I'm going to run this off the top of my head. <laughs> there's uh, myself. Oh, here's some of them. <laughs> Uh, Mike Roy, Pat Carroll, Joe Fristacci, Eric Chinchette, John Delahanty, Tom Emery, Bob Malley, Dave Reed, Sue Weatherby, Steve Goldstein, Frank O'Shea, uh, myself, Paul Sear, Frank and Debbie Butterworth, Russ Leonard, Roy and Karen Dunphy, Dunphy Dick McGoldrick, John Chapman, Milo Savadny uh, Soquist, uh, Joel Russ, Bob Monks, Ken Johnson, Tim Thompson, Joe and Sue Croto. And any of these people will, of course, excuse themselves when this proposal is before them, their respective boards and commissions. I That's my understanding, sure. yes. I okay. think that was. Yeah, I, the staff that's, who are participating on those committees are doing so, so that in an ex officio capacity so that we are aware of uh, what's going on since it's happening on our property. You mean Bob Malley? Yeah, Bob and Sue so Weatherby, if in fact. We do want to make sure we don't get too many people on the committee so that the only people left are people that would vote no. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm, what I was trying to indicate is they will not be recusing themselves since they're not in there in an advocacy capacity to begin with. They're a resource more than anything else. Exactly. Okay. Anybody else in the council? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Good evening, counselors. I'm John Boomer from Nine Delano Park, and um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak briefly uh, for myself and many of my neighbors. I feel tonight, uh, once again, uh, very upset about the process. Um, we were not told that this was going to be a full-blown presentation. Um, it, uh, it was alleged to me simply to be a referring to the rest of the town committees, i.e. the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and the Planning Board. Um, and this just continues the um, lack of trust that um, many of us in Delano Park have been feeling since first hearing of this project, this proposal, um, middle, during the middle of May. And so um, do excuse me if I'm um, a little bit emotional about this because we have not been informed early enough in the process to give full input. The, first off, I must say that I and many of my neighbors, especially the abutters, are in opposition to this site, the southern three acres, three and a half acres of Fort Williams, to be given over to such a single use operation. Uh, we are not in opposition to supporting the Little League and the youth soccer boosters in getting more fields for young people. We just feel this site is the wrong one. We are requesting that public hearings be held by both the Planning Board and yourselves concerning this very important issue, the proposed multi-purpose ball field. We have been told that it will be intensively and continuously used. The zoning ordinance which covers Fort Williams calls for public input from the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and especially the abutters. And we are now obviously aware of this situation and are going to um, try to make sure that due process is followed and that whatever rules and regulations that I'm suddenly becoming much more aware of are followed uh, precisely and exactly. Um, we also uh, ask, because we have only recently been informed of this project, we ask to be given adequate time to prepare testimony, both private and professional, to preserve the attributes and values of our neighborhood. Some people, including myself, move to that neighborhood for very specific reasons. I don't want to go into all of them right now, but peace, quiet, and tranquility was very high on that list. To um, 
go slightly more into the uh, trust and awareness issue. Um, during the two-hour informational meeting that I attended by the, um, some of the members of the committee that was, was just talked about, um, where I and one of my other neighbors, uh, several of my neighbors were not even informed of the meeting. Uh, it just was not told to them, so we could not attend, just as um, getting a big turnout tonight, for instance, uh, was, was not, uh, we did not understand that. But to my surprise, and to many of my neighbors' surprises, now that we're starting to get into the process, and I've had several discussions with town, um, uh, uh, the, the town manager and the town planner, um, I was quite shocked to find, and I don't know if, if all of you happen to know, that this past Saturday there is a, another ball field being constructed within Fort Williams. And I'll pass this around. And so when one is trying to um, um, understand where the abutters are trying to um, come from on this issue, that is just one of the examples that, that we have uncovered. Uh, we also understand that there was a grant that was applied for um, by the town without the knowledge of the town council before it was, was uh, approved. Um, that's the initial things that I have to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> there's gonna, it's the, I think the track it's gonna take, it's gonna go to, before the planning board and the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and they will have a hearing and uh, I don't think we're trying to push anything along ahead of you. And then it'll come back to the council to be acted upon. So you are here and I'm a believer if anybody comes, they ought to have a chance to say something. And for or against, and you have opened up probably some of their questions and it will help them in the decision. So is there anybody else out there who would like to say something? Uh, good evening, I'm Michael Roy, I live at 51 Hillcrest Road. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, <clears throat> a member of this committee. Uh, I'm also the director of fields for Cape Elizabeth Little League. Um, just by way of introduction, I will tell you that, uh, well, first of all, if you look at my lawn at home, you'd say, gee, this guy needs to spend more time in his own fields, let alone somebody else's. Uh, I. Uh, uh, took this position on the board of Little League to, to uh, try to improve fields in this town after experiencing, um, through my oldest boy, uh, the condition of the fields that some of the kids are currently playing on. Uh, the picture that's being passed to you uh, is a picture of the, uh, I believe, anyway, is a picture of the AA, what is currently being utilized as a AA field at Fort Williams. Uh, if any of you have had children who have played on that field, you know that it is a totally inadequate and unsafe field uh, for kids to play on. And year after year, we've tried to make it better by uh, uh, bringing loam in, spreading loam, trying to cover uh, foundations that are poking up through the surface uh, and uh, rendering the field unsafe. We've had pieces of rebar coming up through the, through the surface. Uh, we've had dads out there with hacksaws trying to cut them down so kids aren't hurt. Uh, but this is the kind of playing surface we're forced to use presently. Uh, this year, uh, we had a very generous offer from some of the fathers at the AA le uh, level to uh, make a more uh, concerted effort to address that surface condition of that AA field. As I said in the past, we have uh, endeavored to merely cover it over with loam, which is a very uh, temporary fix and obviously not very uh, effective. We are not building a ball field there. First of all, that is a, an ongoing use. Uh, that ball field has been in use for as long as I know. Uh, what we are doing is merely addressing the surface condition. Uh, we plan to uh, lay sod there uh, so that it's going to look pretty much as it did before, only a much safer and better playing surface. That site still has major problems in terms of the size of the site, uh, drainage problems, and other long-term site problems. This is really just a temporary fix to get us safely through maybe a few seasons there. 
Uh, but that's the best we're going to do with that site. It's really not an adequate site for a baseball field. It's certainly not an adequate site for a soccer field. Um, some of the other issues that John Boomer brought up I would just like to address. Uh, first of all, uh, we, and I think anyone with a reasoned uh, analysis of this would uh, agree, we do, not, we, we do not feel that this is uh, turning this site into a single use. Uh, rather, this is opening it up to uh, multiple members of the community to use, many more people than currently use it, and in fact improving that site. It also does not prohibit others from using the site as they are currently using it. It's a favorite of uh, folks walking their dogs. Certainly this, this does not prohibit people from walking their dogs around that site at all. So I, I don't see where this in any way uh, restricts that area of the, of the fort to a single use sort of proposition. Um, regarding the question of this, um, <clears throat> this field, uh, the impact of this field, I should say, on uh, those who bought close to the property line uh, in Delano Park, I would just say that uh, um, they did buy next to a public park, and uh, that, that site uh, in the public park, in fact, was specified in the master plan many years ago as a ball field. Um, in terms of the uh, um, notice uh, issue of, uh, to the abutters, uh, we, um, once we had a plan, uh, or at least the rudiments of a plan that we could present to the abutters, uh, we, uh, as soon as possible, uh, got a list of abutters from the town, and uh, I actually have that list with me tonight, I can show it to you, uh, but that list, everyone on that list uh, that we were provided was sent a notification of that meeting with, I believe, about two weeks notice. Uh, now, Mr. Boomer's name, for some reason, was crossed out. I don't know why. And I just assumed that somebody in town had crossed his name off as not being an, an abutter, and, and so I did not send him notification, but he did, in fact, come. And ironically, he was the only member of the Delano Park neighborhood or any of the abutters who showed up uh, that evening. Uh, Mr. Irvin, uh, Dr. Irvin, rather, uh, showed up briefly, um, but uh, John was there all night. Um, I guess that's all the comments I have. I, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Anybody got any comments, questions? Thank you. How long is it going to be? Short? Quick? Like, go ahead, I'll let you go. Um, actually, uh, uh, Councilor Jordan, um, there are several things that I disagree with that, that were just said, but this doesn't feel like the proper forum. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond if the counselors feel that's important right now. No, I, I don't think that it's necessary right at this point because there's going to be a public hearing later on and you'll have plenty of opportunity to respond one way or the other. Okay, uh, may I make, make one comment though? When you were summarizing after I spoke, I didn't hear you say that, the, that this council would have a public hearing and if I might uh, read from the ordinance, that it, yeah. that it does. It does. It does call I'm for sorry it. if I didn't mention it. Okay, good. The I plan just wanted it. The That's very important. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Thank you. Anyone care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Councilor Nell. I'd like to make a motion that uh, we set this to public hearing at the next regular council meeting. Um, period. Do I hear a second? I think the prop, I don't want to, you couldn't seem to draw a second, so maybe I could give you a uh, proper chain of command that we are proceeding through, right. which go to the recommend it go to the uh, planning board and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and report back to the council. Well, I just think that uh, uh, I know they're, they're scheduled to meet with both of those groups within the next month. And uh, I think in, in May we'd have an opportunity to hear from uh, interested parties, uh, the folks from Delano Park and anyone else that uh, wants to have an opinion on it. Uh, that's my thinking. Uh, they're, they are, they're planning on meeting with Fort Williams Advisory Commission this week. 
They're going to meet with the planning board May 2nd in a workshop. And uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure uh, what, what precedents we've had to go through a full-blown planning board uh, uh, review. Uh, it seems to me that uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not aware that we have to do that. Uh, and they will have an, uh, certainly an opportunity to, for the planning board to, uh, to, to workshop it and to comment at, the public, at uh, a public hearing. I don't think they'll have time to workshop it and have a public hearing that's within the time frame. Maybe I'm wrong. You, you anything else? I just wanted to. Uh, well, I guess I was going to ask a question of Tom Emery if he would. <laughs> I have put him on the spot. The chair. I don't think it's appropriate to ask him if he's not. Through the chair. Yeah. Okay. He's not going to listen to the issue in his planning board capacity. I don't think he should be put on the spot. Okay. Oh, I think, I don't know what the question was going to be, but I thought it was after the time frame. Well, I still don't think it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. Council McLaughlin. I've got a couple of issues. I'll forget one of them, but bear with me. One thing that I need to bring to public discussion because it's referred to in some of the correspondence that has been presented to the council, and there is a claim that there was a concern about potential conflicts among those who, I'm reading from a letter, who hold either elected or appointed official positions in the town. We've heard the manager tonight reference at least two of the committee members um, who serve on one's on the planning board, one's on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. I did make a phone call last night and asked um, members of this committee who the elected official was. Council Willanell, your name is the one that was presented to me. Um, I, I don't know if you're a committee member or not. If you are a committee member, I think it will be problematic for a fair number of people if you continue with a discussion sitting as a counselor. Well, to respond to that, uh, I have been to several of their meetings, um, and as I see it, I've also gone to ADA meetings. I've also gone to CAPE coalition meetings. Um, uh, I know that there are people here that are, uh, and I'm not particularly a Little League fan, by the way, but that's another story. Uh, and and uh, so I guess, um, I've gone to their meetings as a, as a town councillor. Now, I don't know if that makes, somehow uh, puts me in a, in a position of conflict. Uh, I, I, as I see it, it, it's no more than when I go to ADA meetings and if I support something in ADA, uh, people that were at the last budget meetings uh, workshop uh, heard me uh, um, advocate uh, some ADA expenditures. Uh, I, I, I don't see how we can go to any meetings if we don't, uh, if, if then we have to abstain from voting on these issues. Yeah. So. Thank you. You want to reply to that? No. Madam? Are you still dealing with that? I'm dealing with that because I have another one on my right that wants to question it and I just wanted to throw out that I feel that is something the council should clarify itself and any member of the council is interested enough to go to other meetings then what they're appointed to I think it's a very good idea for information. Now how he handles it beyond that, that's his business. It's Council Cogeshall. I too had also heard that Mr. Linnell was participating in a lot of these discussions and that you cannot really compare it to going to an ADA meeting that is a town organized and staffed meeting. This is an ad hoc community group that's formed themselves. And even though you may be there as an interested citizen or counselor, the perception can be there that you're acting in the capacity of your office. And for that reason alone, in order to um, prevent any kind of question later on in your vote. It's best that you not participate in this item. 
now or in the future. And I also understand your name at one time was listed as a member of the committee that was sent to some of these abutters. And so therefore, I know your interest is genuine, but in the interest of the perception of a conflict, I really would recommend that you not participate. Hmm. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Give, Thank you. Councilor Dahlbeck. Given this discussion, I would suggest that the town manager might find it appropriate to get a uh, memo from our uh, legal advisor giving some guidance to this and uh, future councils about uh, such matters and conflicts of interest. You take care of that, sir? I shall. Thank you. Once more. Mr. Chairman. And we're moving. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, I, uh, uh, I will certainly uh, uh, defer to the wishes of the council and, uh, and the manager on this issue, but just for the record, I'd like to state that I am not an employee of the uh, Little League in any way. Or okay, thank you. Does anybody care to make a motion? I, oops. We had a motion, but it wasn't seconded, as I understood it, unless you seconded it, Councilman. I did not second a motion. No, so I didn't she see it. Two items. I had another question. Oh, excuse me. Move on. Raise the hornet's nest for the smaller one, apparently. I'll go back to the memo that we have from the uh, town planner today in our places, as I mentioned in a previous item, and looking at the ordinance language. There is not a requirement for the planning board to have a public hearing on Fort Williams uses or buildings or activities or anything else the manager and I can find in the ordinance language. I find public hearing, I really think a public hearing at the planning board level would be an unnecessary redundancy. It's the council who makes the final decision on this. And I would be very supportive of having informal comments from the planning board. I think that is the level that's appropriate for them to hold it out. I do not think the planning board needs to do a full-blown site plan review of this. And if they can, in a workshop, make informal comments, come to a consensus on informal comments, that is fine. I do not know, and I do not want to put Mr. Emery on the spot tonight because of his many hats. The general procedure for the planning board, if they want to pass their comments on to the council, if they have to formalize those in a regular session. If they do that, that would be at their regular meeting, which would be after our May meeting in our May meeting. <laughs> in, May. in May. Thank you. So I don't, I don't know for sure what the time frame would be, which is why I wasn't seconding that previous motion. Maybe other people are less confused than I. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Cogshaw. I would like to forward this to the planning board, but give them some guidelines as to what we want them to address in their discussion. Uh, I use as a previous president, uh, precedent the soccer field at the high school. When the so soccer field high school track went through extensive review that dealt with buffering, with, with parking, with hours of operation, um, with lights and speakers, and I would like to um, see that considered in the planning board discussion as part of their proposal. And so when the group comes back to the council for the public hearing, they will be able to address these issues. Thank you. Could you repeat the issues you, you mentioned? Buffering, traffic regulations or traffic patterns, whether we allow cars up there at all. Uh, the parking is basically addressed because of the parking lot that's there. And the hours of operation, lighting, and loudspeaker systems. Thank you. Councilman McLaughlin. What I've heard either tonight or in a phone call was that there was not going to be lights. It was not going to be a speaker system. No was there anything else that was not? You, you, what I heard was the only reason you would have electricity would be for a ball machine, and you can buy a $600 generator like field hockey did for one of those. Um, I certainly agree with the buffering. I'm cons I don't know what you mean about traffic. That we have traffic regulations, whether any cars would be allowed up there at all, 
just basic regulations. Okay, I thought they said the chain was, going to, stay, that chain was going to stay in place. But it's just best to make sure that it's, it's part of the whole review. Yeah, it's, so it's, site. There. it's actually in the site. Now. Okay. And also our town engineer, Mr. Moore, addressed certain concerns to have those addressed as well by the planning board. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I would, not to get involved too much in the middle of this, but I would like to strongly urge that whatever the council eventually adopts on this, that not adopt based on telephone calls and instead adopt based on a set motion. Uh, if, there's, if there's any, you know, we've already heard tonight that a, a grant was applied for without council authorization when in fact the council did it, had authorized it. And uh, I want to make sure this is absolutely 100% documented so 10 years from now if, if someone comes up and wants to put in a loudspeaker, we can go back to the record and see that it was or was not allowed. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Council Dalva. I'm not sure, but was that a motion that, that somebody was making? Yes, it was a motion just for the sake of discussion. Do you want to second it? Is there such a thing as a motion for the sake of discussion? <laughs> <laughs> they all are. Every motion is. <laughs> uh, seeing as, as that uh, seems to be very consistent with the uh, ordinance uh, 1927 as it relates to Fort William Park, I will second it. Do we have a repeat of the motion then? <laughs> See, I trust. We just want the clerk. There would be informal conference, okay. but they would address those issues, right? This is yeah. to refer this issue to the planning board for the informal comments, uh, including issues of buffering, traffic patterns, and or regulations, parking, hours of operation, lighting loud or speaker systems and to address the town engineer's concern which were in a memo. So it would not be going to Fort Williams Advisory anymore? It is, is yeah. going to that automatically anyway. But, and it would be going to the planning board but this is just to direct them to address specific issues. Everybody understand the motion? Is there a report back to Is you? there a time frame? Yeah. We had one listed in our memo. I'm not sure. It says back by May 30th, if that seems feasible. Are you pretty much there as far as that kind of information? Yeah. Public hearing would be here back at the council after we get this information. After you get the information. That's what was in the recommendations, if we refer to it. That's just a recommendation. Well, I'm just asking that Michael wanted a date. Gene wanted a date. Does May 30th seem a reasonable time for you? So I'll amend my motion to say May 30th. Uh, excuse me, why aren't you talking to the abutters at all? Why well, only the proposals, proposals of this operation? They'll be talking to the abutters. And then we'll hear from the abutters at the public hearing. Yes, but for them mm -hmm. to be at the different committees, we need time to prepare. And I'm looking at probably two months to get the professional uh, works to be at the created that are going to support yeah. our side of this. He, he, he needs the microphone to be at the microphone. Would you go to the microphone? Some people can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm John Boomer, 9 Delano Park again. Um, uh, we, of, of, uh, of myself and my neighbors, uh, request at least a time frame of two months to prepare for the planning board meetings and the Fort Williams Advisory Committee meetings that would precede coming back to this council. Uh, again, let me remind you, we only heard about this the middle of, of March. The proponents have been planning this for months and months and months. Um, and um, that's why we need time. And um, we're asking for it. Like. Thank you. Since I let you speak, I have a lady in the rear there who would like to raise a hand. Well, I'm not going through the hearing again. Rosemary Reed, one Dean Way. Mr. Chairman, I was just wondering if you could clarify um, this motion incurs some expense since the cost of uh, funding this project was to be raised by private fundraising, which was slated to begin May 18th. Will any of these costs be uh, paid for by the proponents, or will that be paid for by the town? 
the, it's the responsibility the of, uh, you know, we've already had assurances this evening that this is not to be paid for by the town. Uh, it would come out of the expenses uh, of the group proposing uh, the plan. These, these additional conditions, do you have a rough idea about what the additional expense would be? If I might, these additional conditions, I think, were addressed in a memorandum to the then president of Little League, or, to, <laughs> or at least to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission when this thing first came. I think it was last October. So this should not be anything new. Uh, Councilor Cogswell's list might be a little bit different, but it's essentially a list that, uh, that's been out there in the public arena for uh, since October, I believe it was. Well, I haven't been to any of their meetings. so. Um, but I did have a question because my understanding was that the fundraising drive was supposed to begin May 18th, and I was just concerned, excuse me, about having this um, in a public hearing at the July town council meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Council McLaughlin. I believe it would be a June 12th council public hearing, which yeah. April, two months. So that, that's yeah, just a fact. It's two months away. I obviously have read um, the correspondence from one of the abutters. I'm, I read a lot of opinions, so yes, I do believe if the abutters are going to raise concerns, they need to raise factual concerns that can be substantiated. And it was the request for two months, I believe. We've backed into that fairly nicely, <laughs> unbeknownst to ourselves, perhaps. And think that the proponents are going to have to make a decision whether or not to go ahead with their fundraising. Um, perhaps this evening's vote would give you a feel for council support or lack thereof. Give you some direction. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Jack Lustig, uh, Kildare Road. <clears throat> very, very confusing. Uh, you mention here multi-purpose ball fields, plural. How many ball fields are you talking about? What is multi-purpose? And it makes absolutely no mention here about Little League. Does this thing go on to Babe Ruth League, Double A League? Uh, what are we talking about here? This whole thing is so inconsistent with detail that I find it hard that we could act on anything here. What is multi-purpose? Just a minute. Yes, please. Take a look at the site plan, sir. There's, uh, I know we talk mostly about Little League, and Little League people are involved with this, and this is where the Little League field is, but there's also a soccer field that goes across here, across the outfield section. And I think the detail is there. I mean, it may not be apparent in there, but the detail is available to you. Well, who has the control of this? Who is going to control these fields? Is it going to be limited to Little League? No, it's going to be... It's open to everybody. Yes, yeah, so the town will really... I mean, the council and the town will... Now, will this town the council have to be bogged down to give approval whether it's double A or... Point of order, I don't think we're supposed to be having a uh, debate between uh, two parties uh, at this stage in time. I... I, I just did Well, I know it is confusing that. now because it... Okay. It got confused. Well, not go, some wanted to go on the planning board, some didn't want to go on the planning board. Then we have a public hearing, you can come up and speak. And that's the time they should have all the answers. And move the motion. Thank you. Move the motion. Everyone understand the motion? Just one What's second. the matter? Uh, I'd I'm moving like to the motion so you don't get right. into any no more debate. discussion. Well, I, no, I just wanted to ask. Uh, uh, the council to allow me to abstain from vote until we clarify uh, my position or per perceived or actual ties to Little League. Thank you. Everyone understand the motion? I guess they do. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Those abstaining? Okay, thank you.
Item 125. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 125. To consider a report from the Sewer Ordinance Advisory Committee regarding operation and maintenance of the sewer system and taking necessary action. Do you have anybody here from the Sewer Committee? Yes. Uh, Sheila Hillman, who's the chairman of the Sewer Ordinance Advisory Committee, is here to briefly introduce this item. And also Bob Hunter, who was the consultant. And here from the Portland Water District are Jeff Clements, who is the yes. president of the board of directors of the Portland Water District, uh, Sam Macedo, who is a trustee who represents Gorham, Scarborough, and Cape Elizabeth, uh, David Golombuski of the Water District, Ron Miller of the Water District, and Dan Jellis, the general manager of the district. Thank you. There may be others that I don't know. It's a lot more than I knew. Where is Sheila? Sheila's back here. Oh, I didn't see her. I think Jeff Clements is still the chairman of the board. Yes. Good. Very briefly, I'm Sheila Hillman, and I chair the Sewer Advisory Committee. I live at 6 Phantom Farm Road. This is a, this a recommendation that we are sending you at this point is one that was taken neither lightly nor easily. It, recommend, it represents several months of very hard work on our part. And as, uh, as you have read, we are recommending that we sever our ties with the Portland Water District for sewer purposes only, of course. That being because we feel that we have identified a real $100 plus thousand dollar savings per year annually, that is, if we take over the operation ourselves or if alternatively we perhaps contract privately with someone else. There was no member, well, excuse me, there was one member of the sewer board uh, committee who dissented, but there was no other member who could turn his or her back on $100,000 savings per year. In fact, there were members who said if those savings turned out to be real savings of only half that amount, they could still, in all conscience, do nothing else than to recommend that we seek alternative ways to run the sewer system in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, I could entertain any questions that you might have, but that is briefly where we are. Anybody have any questions for Sheila? Yes, Council McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Do the projected savings include all costs of severing all appropriate ties with the Portland Water? They do not. They do not include the startup cost of severing those relationships. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Council Dahlbeck. What are those startup costs estimated on? Well, that would depend on the Portland Water District, how difficult they wanted to make those startup costs. There could be legal costs that we could not begin to anticipate. Those would be the primary ones. It, it, it depends as well, uh, Mr. Dahlbeck, on uh, what position the district would take in terms of some of the equipment that's already in the plant that we have already paid for and whether or not they took a friendly or an adversarial position as to uh, who that equipment belonged to. Doesn't it make it relatively difficult to look at this from a financial standpoint without knowing more about that? Uh, there are a number of reasons why this was suggested to be referred to workshop. Uh, that is something that needs more in-depth discussion, but because this issue is out in the public arena, we thought it would be very helpful for people to begin to understand it better if, if they saw the highlights of what the committee has done through Mrs. Hellman's presentation, through Bob Hunter's follow-up overview of it, and uh, then through the district response. By the way, I do think the sewer committee did a real fine job here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You have... Mr. Hunter, you have a few words of wisdom? Oh my gosh. As you recall, we completed our primary report last October, which was presented uh, to the Council. At that time, it was, refer it was referred to the Sewer Advisory Committee for uh, review, discussion, and recommendations. Uh, I worked with the committee over the winter uh, to try to 
pre uh, prepare more detailed analyses and to obtain additional data from the district in order to provide the information that the committee felt they needed. Uh, the committee recommended that the district provide uh, detailed data on their operating costs for the years 1991 through 1994, uh, which the district did and submitted uh, to the council. Uh, that data was in a slightly different format than what was in the report, uh, but essentially it was uh, very similar and compatible. Uh, <clears throat> I believe the manager provided you with a summary uh, status report of what the committee has done. And in that, there was a spreadsheet tabulation which indicated the uh, operating costs of the system for 1991 through 1994. And that was segregated between the costs that were incurred by the uh, Portland Water District for the treatment facilities and interceptor sewers that they are responsible for, and also data from the town manager on the town expenses for operating, maintaining, and managing the uh, collector sewer component of the work. The total of those two represent the total costs that were expended uh, to support the sewer systems on those years. <clears throat> the district also has presented to the town their budget or a planned budget for 1995. Likewise, the uh, <coughs> town manager has developed a budget for operating the town uh, sewer system uh, for that same period. Uh, that data was included on the spreadsheet also. At the request of the committee, uh, we prepared a tentative budget for an alternative administrative system, either a town-operated system or perhaps consideration of privatization through uh, contract operations. Uh, <clears throat> that data was shown on the far right-hand column of the uh, of the spreadsheet. As you recall in our basic report, we made a comparison of actual 1993 operating data, which was the last year of complete data that we had at that time, and compared that with an estimated operating uh, uh, cost if the town uh, took over and operated and maintained the system. <coughs> In the earlier report, the, there was a cost differential of about $99,000. Uh, based on the committee's work over the winter and the revised uh, and updated uh, cost data, for 1995, you, as you'll see on the spreadsheet, uh, there's a differential cost of about $104,000. Now, I think at this stage of the game, uh, we're not within that accuracy of saying whether it's ninety-nine or $104,000. Uh, but the implication is that there is a substantial cost differential between uh, the current institutional system that you have uh, and an alternative system. Now, as was pointed out, uh, these are simply the operating costs and do not reflect the uh, initial changeover or setup costs that would be incurred. Uh, this would inclu include the legal expenses that might be involved and at this time, those are very uh, difficult to judge. There's also certain instrumentation in the system where the signals are now transmitted to the Portland Water District's office, uh, and there will have to be some fairly significant changes made in the, uh, in the instrumentation and alarm systems uh, uh, if the change were to be made. So our position was to tr try to develop the uh, data uh, through the cooperation of the Water District and uh, to present alternative plans to the committee on which they could base their uh, decision. Uh, as noted in the memo and as discussed by the committee, there are uh, various uh, reasons why the differential is there. Uh, you have a question of whether an equal level of service is being provided in all areas, and we must recognize that the Water District's accounting systems, uh, as they operate as a special uh, district, is not identical uh, with the town's way of accounting for costs. Uh, the alternative budgets that we set up are best, uh, based on the best uh, judgment that we could have. Uh, we believe they are set up to adequately operate and maintain the system through its design life. 
to meet the requirements of the regulatory agencies and we to respond to emergencies that uh, <coughs> that may arise. Uh, we have reviewed this uh, with the manager because certain of these costs will uh, be transferred from the water district's administration to the town office and we wanted to be uh, be sure that these could be absorbed within the cost elements that we have put forth and uh, I believe the costs we have uh, do reflect that. I think that's all I can say at this time and glad to answer any uh, questions that you may have uh, on the cost tabulations that were put together. Anybody got a comment question? Council Dalbert. I have a question on the alternative plan costs. Uh, as you get down uh, on the schedule that we have, uh, which I assume came from you folks, it's, it's uh, of this one that uh, was relatively long. Uh, there's an area called uh, Town of Cape Elizabeth Collector Costs, mm -hmm. which seems to vanish uh, on the alternative plan. And I'm just curious how we wipe those out. Uh, those costs uh, are all integrated in the cost items up above uh, in that the town would be assuming all of the operation <coughs> maintenance and management costs so rather than trying to segregate out costs between uh, the treatment okay. and the other systems it was combined together so the far right hand column we reflects a joint budget for uh, operation of both components of the system okay so that's what took the uh, renewal and replacement cost, uh, the 50000 just went up and added to the thirty to come up with the eighty. That's correct. Thank you. Anybody else on the council? Thank you. Now uh, is a someone from the water district who would like to speak? Yes, Mr. <coughs> tell us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Jordan and uh, Councillors, um, and Michael for introducing the trustees that were here and the other members that were here. I would like also to mention that uh, uh, Trustee Brigitte Kingsbury, who also represents uh, Cape Elizabeth, uh, was interested in being here, but uh, she just recently had a baby last week, and the baby schedule makes it a little bit difficult for her to be here, but otherwise um, um, she uh, wished to be here. <coughs> Um, since it's my understanding that the council will be referring this item to a workshop, uh, I will be very brief and, uh, and very general. Um, we did submit to you, uh, I believe it was in your packet, a letter that we sent to the councillors uh, dated uh, April 5th, and I won't repeat uh, a lot of the material that's in that. Um, the council is faced with a very important question, and that's how best to meet the uh, future wastewater needs of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, the, as you heard from Bob and in his material, the consultant's report estimated a 7% uh, cost difference uh, between the existing system, existing management system, and the uh, town only system. And the committee has recommended to sever ties with the district. Uh, we certainly appreciate the courtesies that the uh, committee and the consultant have provided us over the past few months as we've worked with them. and. Uh, um, and, and they've, they, you know, they, they've been helpful in, in, in allowing us to participate in their deliberations. Um, however, we do believe that uh, given the uncertainties of the estimates, uh, particularly estimating a new wastewater management system, uh, that the uh, cost comparisons do show that the district's costs are competitive. And uh, we do disagree and do not agree with the recommendations of the committee. The uh, district was given the uh, charted responsibility for wastewater treatment in Cape Elizabeth uh, back in 1971 by Cape Elizabeth and seven other municipalities. Um, and it's my belief that we've done our job responsibly and responsively since uh, the Cape North system went online in 1977. Um, since then, um, the town has, to the best of my knowledge, been satisfied with our services. 
Um, particularly, uh, I think that's demonstrated by uh, the fact in 1989 to 1991, uh, the town uh, approached us to operate and maintain uh, the 18 town pump stations that uh, had been deteriorating over time in the town's collection system. Uh, we've been methodically repairing and uh, upgrading those stations uh, since then. And through the course of our discussions with the committee, um, uh, recognizing uh, some of the concerns that they were raised, um, we have offered uh, to turn these stations back to the town if there's been any indication of a dissatisfaction with our service. Um, we understand basically that, uh, um, you know, f uh, that uh, the CAPE has been satisfied with our services and that hasn't been a uh, significant consideration in, this, uh, um, in their recommendation. As you consider the question before you, uh, I'd like you to consider three things, or at least I'd like to provide three things for you. One is a commitment, and I'd like to pr present a request, and I'd like to present an offer. Um, the commitment is basically a reaffirmation of our commitment to be responsive to your needs. Um, a commitment basically to preserve the long-term integrity of the sewer system and the treatment plants and the pump stations and a commitment to reduce or eliminate unnecessary costs. One uh, example of that commitment is a couple of years ago, shortly after I was uh, appointed general manager of the district, um, I had a meeting with uh, my town manager um, as he was working on a, a, a different sewer study at that particular time. And uh, in the course of the discussion, I accepted a challenge from Mike to hold our assessments flat for three years. and. Um, and the first handout that's, that I have sent to you, um, or just handed out to you, shows that in 1994, our assessments went down 3%. In, in 1995, this year's assessment is flat. And barring any unknown emergencies, uh, we believe that we will be under that particular assessment. And in 1996, we should be able to do the same thing. Um, so this is just an indication of our commitment, item number one, uh, to being responsive to your needs. The second item I indicated was a request. I do have a request of you. And basically my request is that you look before you leap. That I ask that you review the consultant study and the district services with a critical eye. In the handout, I included a list of um, benefits of being a part of the district's regional system. Since I understand this is going to workshop, I won't go through, um, go through the list of items. Um, we can review those in the workshop. The other area where I think it's important to look before you leap is that uh, a lot of, in the, in the summary or the comparison between